Hello and welcome to a digital statistics lecture for Salt Lake Community College. In this video we're going to be going through section 1.2, uh, observational studies versus designed experiments. In the previous section we had talked about the beginning of statistics and also described that statistics means how to collect, organize, summarize, and analyze your data. As I also talked about, I said the rest of chapter 1 will really be talking about how we collect the data. And that's what we're going to start doing here. We're going to talk about how you can split two different types of uh, studies into what we call observational studies versus experimental studies. Observational studies means that you measure a response variable without influencing the values of either the response or the explanatory variable. So that without influencing is very important. It's basically thinking about observational studies as people watching. You sit in a room, you look at people do things, maybe you watch people go by in a busy uh, in a busy public square or something, but you're not interacting with them. You're not doing anything to try to change things. That way we consider it an observational study. Uh, observational studies are also considered things like surveys. If you go to a person and just ask them a question, that's not influencing things. Um, unless your study is focused on what happens when you change how the question is worded, most times just asking people questions is considered an observation. With observational studies, we have them split up into three different styles, and there are more than this, but these are the most common ones. You ever have cross-sectional, which means studies that are collected at one particular time, so it's done once, and then you're done. Most surveys are cross-sectional. You go up to a person, you ask them a question, and then you're done. There's no nothing more done after that or before that. You could have case control studies, which are observational studies that require individuals to look back in time to record their measurements, so it's retrospective, which also means it's questionable in terms of its validity. Uh, for example, if I asked you, how much money did you spend on groceries in 2016? Now, at the time of recording this video, 2016 was four years ago. So for me, I don't really know how much I spent on groceries in that year. I can make a guess, or I can make an educated guess, but it doesn't mean it's going to be necessarily accurate. So there's always a little bit of scrutiny that you need to have with case control studies. Uh, lastly, cohort studies are observational studies that track individuals repeatedly over time. So it's prospective. Uh, what that means is that you gather individuals and then you keep analyzing them. Whether that's every day or once a month, you, you keep having them come in or you keep uh, analyzing them and, and seeing what happens. Um, that is what we call a cohort study. Uh, there's, a, there's even a movie example of this a few years ago. I think it was called Boyhood. Uh, where a, 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 a boy at the age, I think 10 or something, was analyzed for a decade of his life, or even more than that. Um, and all they did was they just watched different uh, things about him. Uh, and you also tend to see this in nature versus nurture studies, trying to see if like uh, how, um, how a person is raised. So just watching a person over a long period of time, we call that a cohort study. That usually has a lot more information, and those are also the ones that are much more often put in news because that takes a lot of time and a lot of money. So those uh, usually do get a lot more recognition than uh, cross-section or case control studies. Now, if you change things in a study, we're going to call that an experimental study. So measuring response variable after intentionally changing the value of the explanatory variable. So if you're actually changing things, we call that an experimental study. You may also be wondering about these words that you do see in the definitions. You see response variable and explanatory variable. And you also see that in experimental, response variable and explanatory variable. These are the two variables that we talk about in observational versus experimental studies. And a good way to think about it, at least at first, um, is similar to a cause and effect relationship. You'll notice that I'm a little bit strained saying that, though. Um, it's not really the best way to think about a cause and effect, but it's better to think about like a give and a take. So um, the response variable is the one that you analyze or that uh, 
or is the one that you're trying to determine. So the target of the study. And the explanatory one is the one that uh, you're trying to uh, check or you're trying to change in most instances. Um, it's basically like the explanatory variable explains the response. That's why I said it's it's nice to think about it at first as a cause and effect, and I'll put those in quotes, explanatory and response. It's good to think about that at first, at least to get an idea of the direction there, in terms of the explanatory is the one you start with, and the response is the one that you get as a response to that. So the words are are trying to help you with that. But I'm trying to really get away from the words cause and effect because, as we'll talk about in a minute, it's very hard to work with things uh, with cause, at least in a lot of these studies. But that's a good way to think about what explanatory and response mean. It's similar to cause and effect, but really try not to use those specific words. Just think about that mentally. Anyway, back to the definitions. Uh, confounding. Confounding means that you cannot distinguish between the effects of two or more explanatory variables. And this happens pretty often. Uh, this means that there are multiple explanatory variables, or there are multiple variables that are influencing a certain system, but I'm not really sure which one is causing the effect, or is causing the, uh, the response variable to occur. For example, maybe if I have a plant in the woods, and I am trying to see how it grows. Well, there's a lot of things that influence how a plant grows. There's the amount of sunlight, there's soil composition, there's weather, um, there's other foliage around the plant. These are all different variables that can influence the growth of that plant. However, if the plant does show growth, or maybe it, it starts to wilt, either way, I'm not exactly sure which of those variables made that happen. I'm not exactly sure if it was the soil composition that did it. I'm not sure if it was the amount of sunlight that they got that did it. And I'm not exactly sure to what degree each of those had an effect. Um, so that's what we call confounding. I can't really distinguish between the effects of multiple variables. That happens pretty often, uh, particularly with observational studies. If that plant was in a forest, it's I can't control anything. I can't change soil composition, I can't change sunlight, I can't uh, move foliage around so it has more room, I can't do any of that because I'm just observing. But if I have an experimental study, it's a lot easier to control those confounding variables, or the, that level of confounding, um, because I can control things. Maybe if I only wanted to change the level of sunlight, I would keep the soil composition and... Um, uh, the weather the same for multiple different plants and just change the one variable to see what happened. It's a lot easier to control confounding in experimental studies. Uh, with confounding, there's two different variables we consider in confounding, the first being a lurking variable, and that's a variable that wasn't even considered in the study, but affects the response variable. Uh, for example, the one that I just brought up with the plant in the forest, maybe I didn't even consider animals or insects. So insects eating the plants or animals eating the plant, I, those are variables I didn't even consider. So those are lurking variables because they lurk in the background. Now with observational studies, there's so many of those. In any system, it's really hard to consider every variable that is possible. And so because of that, we have this incredibly important comment right here. Because of lurking variables, observational studies cannot allow a researcher to claim causation, only correlation. This is why I wanted to get away from that specific wording of cause and effect relationship. Um, when I'm doing an observational study specifically, specifically an observational study where I can't really control anything, I cannot make the claim that one thing caused another. I can't... Um, survey people, ask them questions, and say, okay, definitively, this thing caused, this thing A caused this thing B. I can't say that for sure. 
because I'm not controlling any variables. All I can say is that there was a correlation or a connection between the two variables. There are a couple kind of joke examples of this that do help get this point across. Uh, one example uh, was from the 90s, um, looking at a particular summer, it was like maybe the summer of 97, uh, researchers found that the level uh, or the number of ice cream sales increased dramatically. Also, during that same summer, the number of murders increased dramatically. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean that ice cream caused murder or murder caused ice cream. They just both happen to increase at the same time. So there's a correlation between those two things. There's no causation there. All I looked at were observations. I just observed that there was more ice cream and there were more murders. What is likely is that there's a lurking variable, perhaps the heat of the summer, that could be affecting both of those. Maybe increased heat causes more ice cream, and maybe increased heat causes agitation, which causes murders, I guess. So that's an example of one. Another example is uh, one that was released uh, about 10 years ago, I think around 2010 or so, um, which looked at the global temperature of the world and the number of pirates in the world. And the graph, if I just draw a little thing here, if I look at, uh, say, temperature on the side here as it increases and pirates increasing, what we found was a general trend that increased, which means as the temperature increase in the world, the number of pirates also increase in the world. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that temperature causes, like global warming causes pirates, or my favorite, pirates cause global warming. Those aren't necessarily true. All that means is that they were both correlated at the same time. They both increased or decreased at the same time, or there was some connection there. So, for observational studies, we cannot claim causation. If we were doing an experiment, though, experimental studies do allow causation because we can control variables. That's the important key there. Because you can control variables in experiments, you can claim causation there. Now, to what degree it is successful is a, a different question. All right, anyway. So lurking variables is one type of confounding. Another type of confounding is, well, confounding variables. A confounding variable is a variable in a study where you can't tell the difference between the effect and another effect. So that's what we talked about with confounding. If you have multiple variables and I can't tell the difference, those are called confounding variables. But we also consider lurking variables, the ones we didn't even consider, as part of the topic of confounding. So just another term about that. Uh, last thing, this is something I talked about already a couple times in 1.1. A census is a list of information from all individuals uh, in a population. This is basically where we didn't need to do a sample because we have all the information from the population already. Um, if I do analyze the entire population, that is called a census. Now again, not realistic in a lot of circumstances. Um, maybe if I'm analyzing all of Utah, and I'm trying to analyze what brand of, well, we just talked about ice cream, what brand of ice cream is favorable to adults in Utah. I can't really go to every single adult in Utah and ask them what brand of ice cream they like the best. What I can do is find 50, hopefully random individuals in Utah and ask them what ice cream brand they like the best. That I could probably do, but that would be a sample. So this probably should have been in 1.1, but it's here anyway. Okay, so for a couple examples, we have a few exercises to do here. So not as long as 1.1. Uh, determine if each study depicts an observational study or an experiment. So those are the differences we're looking for here. Observation versus experiment. Uh, first, rats with cancer are divided into two groups. One group received 5 milligrams of medication that is thought to fight cancer, and the other received 10 milligrams. After two years, the spread of cancer is measured. Okay, so we have the rats with cancer, and what we're trying to determine with observational experiments is if something was intentionally changed. What we have here is that one group received 5 milligrams of medication, and another received 10 milligrams of medication, 
That means that something was done, that different individuals received different treatments. There are treatments here, so this is definitely considered an experiment. Secondly, conservation agents netted 250 largemouth bass in a lake and determined how many were carrying parasites. So, even though it says that they netted 250 largemouth bass, that's simply the saying that they gathered 250 bass and they determined how many were carrying parasites. In this case, nothing was done to them. All that was done is that they were analyzed, they were observed. They were just tested to see if they have parasites. They didn't do anything to the lake, at least in the description here. We don't have anything that, that says that they gave parasites to some bass or they changed some things in the lake and saw how many got parasites. They just see, saw how many had parasites. This is simply an observation. Thirdly, 7th grade students are randomly divided into two groups. One group is taught math using traditional techniques. The other is taught math using reform method. After one year, each group is given an achievement test to compare proficiency. All right, this is like the rats example. We have one group that is taught math using traditional techniques, and another is taught math using a reform method. There are treatments involved here. Individuals are receiving something they didn't already have. There's that change of that reform method. So this is considered an experiment. This also highlights something um, kind of uh, tangential to this, but there's something called the novelty effect that comes into a lot of education. Novelty effect essentially is saying that uh, behavior changed simply to the novelty uh, for the novelty of what was introduced. Uh, for example, if you have a classroom and you give uh, a classroom next to it, you give all the classrooms next to it iPads. Every individual gets an iPad, whereas the other class had nothing. They just had the traditional techniques as it listed here. What tends to happen is that the individuals or class that had the iPad will do a lot better than the class that didn't. And however, a reason for that could easily be the novelty of receiving something new. That could be the case here as well. The reform method could be a novelty, something new, and that could in incite different behavior or improve behavior. The problem with the novelty effect though is that novelty wears off. That eventually the novelty of something wears off and there has to be something new. Which is a really big problem in education because there's always studies that say that putting iPads into the classroom will always help education, but eventually those will die out and there has to be something new. And it leads to a big cost for uh, different educational institutions. Uh, that's just a side note. Um, things to think about and how studies are done. Uh, lastly, a survey was conducted asking 400 people, do you prefer Coke or Pepsi? So they just asked people, do you prefer Coke or Pepsi? They didn't experiment on them, give them Coke or Pepsi and say, which one do you like better? They just asked them which one do they prefer, so this is an observational experiment. Or this is an observational study, sorry. Now, like the last one, there is a kind of a note here. When you're asking the question, do you prefer Coke or Pepsi? Um, there's another kind of effect called recency bias, where the first thing that people hear in a list of objects tends to get a higher preference level than they would otherwise. So what a lot of studies would actually do is they would ask maybe 200 people, do you prefer Coke or Pepsi? And they would ask the other 200 people, do you prefer Pepsi or Coke? To try to eliminate that problem. Now that really isn't a treatment because they're not they're just trying to get rid of a problem. They're not trying to uh, use that and see how that influenced people. But there have been a lot of studies that show that when you do list uh, objects, it is always good to randomize them. Okay, so that's just a discussion of observational and experiment and then a couple uh, notes that I just like to talk about. All right, two more exercises. Daily coffee consumption. Is there an association between daily coffee consumption and the occurrence of skin cancer? Researchers asked 93,676 women to disclose their coffee drinking habits and also determined which of the women had non-melanoma skin cancer. The researchers concluded that consumption of six or more cups of caffeinated coffee per day was associated with a reduction in non-melanoma skin cancer. 
Okay. So we have a few questions here to break this down. First, was this an observational study or an experiment? And if it's observational, what type of observational study it was? Okay, so looking back, it says researchers asked 93,000 women, which is a lot, that's a huge sample, uh, to disclose their coffee drinking habits and also determined which of the women had not melanoma skin cancer. That means all they, they asked them and then they determined some things. They did not do anything. They didn't tell the women to go drink coffee and check if they ha got non-melanoma skin cancer. And they didn't check non-melanoma skin cancer and then or give people non-melanoma skin cancer and then check their coffee habits or anything like that. They're just looking at these two variables and seeing if they're linked. There is nothing done here, so this is an observational study. Now, since it's observational, we have to talk about what type of observational. What they mean is, is this a cross-sectional, case control, or cohort? Now, from what is given here, we were, uh, there's a couple different answers to this. I would definitely not say it's cohort. Cohort, remember, is, is over a long period of time analyzing. I don't see anything here saying that they analyze women for like six months or 12 months or something like that to analyze their coffee drinking habits and non melanoma skin cancer levels. But I could see arguments for either cross-sectional or case control. If you say it's cross-sectional, I can see an argument for that because it looks like they just asked the women at that time to just uh, describe their coffee drinking habits and see if they have non-melanoma skin cancer. The latter of which definitely just being an at that time sense of measure. So it was only done at that one period of time. I could definitely see it being cross-sectional. However, I could also see an argument for case control. Case control is supposed to be retrospective, where you look back. The reason I could see an argument for case control is because it's talking about their coffee drinking habits. And habits is something that is done over a period of time. So it could be argued that since they're looking back at their habits that they consistently do, this is a case control situation. However, another argument for cross-sectional is that if it's a habit, it's also done still at this point. So it could still also be argued for cross-sectional for that reason. However, I could see argument for both ways. You'll tend to see that in statistic there, statistics, there isn't always just a set singular answer. You could very often argue a point. Okay. With B, what is the response and what is the explanatory variable? So for the response uh, and the explanatory, again, you're trying to think about this, this as a pseudo cause and effect. Not exactly a cause and effect, but in that direction. And what that means is that I'm going to talk about the explanatory variable first, which is the one that we're starting with and seeing what the response of that was. So looking at this, we want to look at the last sentence. The researchers concluded that consumption of six or more cups of caffeinated coffee per day was associated with a reduction in non melanoma skin cancer. Notice also they use that word association instead of causation. And that's because this is an experimental study, or this is a observational study, so they cannot claim causation. They can only claim association. So nice on them to use that word. Anyway, uh, that sentence there should give me all the description that I need to determine if this is a, uh, which one is explanatory, which was which one is response. It starts off with the researchers conclude that consumption of six or more cups of caffeinated coffee per day was associated with skin cancer. So that means the explanatory was the coffee or the amount of coffee consumed per day. That's what we're starting with. The coffee then explains the response of skin cancer. So that's what we have as our response variable, skin cancer. All right. Hopefully, if you start to see you start to see some examples of this again, think about it similar to a cause and effect relationship. Just be careful of that specific word.
Lastly, can we conclude drinking six or more cups of cups of coffee reduces the chances of non-melanoma skin cancer? Now, the answer of this should be a straight up no. The reason that we say no is because this statement is way more definitive than it should be. Can we conclude drinking six or more cups, cups of coffee reduces the chance of non-melanoma skin cancer, which means it's like definitive. It's like, oh, if you drink coffee, it's going to reduce cancer, reduce the chance of you getting cancer. We don't know that for sure. All we know, as the researchers said here, is that there is an association between the two variables, not that there is a causation. So the answer for this is no. All we can say is that there is an association or correlation between the two variables. That's as much as we can say for this one. So be very careful with your conclusions there, particularly if you have an observational study. Okay, uh, last one. Get married, gain weight. Are young couples who marry or cohabitate more likely to gain weight than those who stay single? Researchers followed 8,000 men and women for seven years. At the start of the study, none of the participants were married or living with a romantic partner. The researchers found that women who married or cohabitated during the study gained nine pounds more than single women, and married or cohabitating men gained, on average, six pounds more than single men. Now, I'm going to say right here, pause the video, go ahead and try this question on your own, and see how you did by unpausing and checking the last couple minutes here. All right. Now, A doesn't even try to flirt with the chance that it is experimental. It just asks straight up, why is this an observational study? Now, the reason why it's an observational study is basically the same reason we had before. Nothing was intentionally changed. to the men and women. For example, no individuals were told to get married or not. So no variables were controlled. That's basically why it's an observational study. They, they didn't control things and say, okay, you individuals you guys have to stay single for the next seven years and you guys and girls have to get married in the next seven years and then we're going to check your weights they didn't do that they didn't intentionally change those they just saw what happened furthermore since we have that it said for seven years we have that this happened for a really long time that means that this is a cohort study because it was done over a long period of time. So that's what we have as our answer here for observational. It is observational because nothing was intentionally changed, and it's a cohort type of observational study because it was over a long period of time. All right, part B. What is the response and explanatory variable? Again, like before, I'm going to start this one off by talking about what the explanatory variable is. Okay, the explanatory variable. So the explanatory variable is what you're starting with and you're trying to see if that explains whatever response you got. Uh, based on the last sentence, the researchers found that women who married or cohabitated during the study gained 9 pounds. So this last sentence here, and the same thing for men. That direction gives me which one is explanatory and which one is the response. They're starting off with their cohabitation status. So married or not. or living alone or not. Uh, their, ex their cohabitation status is their explanatory variable, whereas the response from that is the weight gain, or weight change, I'll say. 
The reason I say weight change instead of weight gain like they indicated in the study is because there's probably some individuals here that married or cohabitated that lost weight. So the variable itself was how much weight changed. Thirdly, identify some of the potential lurking variables in the study. Now, if you did this on your own, there's a plethora of different lurking variables in the study, and you can come up with a lot. Uh, for example, you could consider diet as a potential lurking variable. There's, there's nothing about the different diets that they were on. Um, you could also consider uh, physiological differences or um, genetics. As a, as a difference. Different people have uh, different ways of gaining weight or losing weight. You could also consider job as a potential lur lurking variable. Some jobs are much more active than others, so it's easier to gain or lose weight depending on their job. Um, uh, where they live. It's usually considered that in the colder areas, it's less likely to go out so people are more likely to gain weight in colder areas like Alaska or something um, than they are in Florida, where it's warm and people go out more often. There's a lot of different lurking variables. Just try to come up with some and make an argument for it. You'll notice that in all these, every time I talk about something, I try to argue why. Like, I argue why it's an observational study. I argue why these are reasons for lurking variables. You always want to have reasoning behind everything that you have. Lastly, can we conclude that getting married or cohabitating causes one to gain weight? The answer should be a concrete no, and the reason is that word cause right there. No in caps, we cannot claim causation with observational studies. We can only claim correlation. That's as much as we can do. All we can say is that there's a connection between cohabitation status and the amount of weight gained or lost. That's as much as we can say. We can't say that there was a definite cause there. So be very careful with that. If they did control more and make an experimental study, like theoretically if they told some individuals to go get married and some individuals not to go get married, then you could possibly make the claim that there is a cause there and you can try to argue that because it's an experimental study. But with observational studies, we cannot do that. All right, but with that said, that covers section 1.2. Uh, I recommend going and trying your hand at the homework for section 1.2 before moving on to 1.3. But with that said, I hope you have a great day.